What's good with the YouTube a convex perspective? It's your boy Flacco coming live and direct, and as always, with a little bit of energy this morning. And we're gonna straight get to it. We're gonna be discussing the new Asterasa's history. We're gonna break down the pre-existing conditions of how the facilities used to be ran before there was ever an NR and how the first push of the North Daniels came about all the way up until the disbandment of the new Asterasa. So in order to understand this, we need to go a little bit into our histories. So I'd say around 1976, you know, 76 to 78, there's different theories and views. And you got to remember, this is a, you know, with my, a full disclaimer here. This is the history that's been taught to me. I've done a lot of cross checks. I talk to a lot of people. I have my references and my resources. So I look into everything. But the CDC at that time started the validation clampdown process. And they started to slam down all those that were part of the big organizations at that time. And the NF, the AB, the MA, you know, and the BGF. Because of all the numerous gang murders and the gang activities that were really, really, uh, really, really going on strenuous out there on the streets and in the penal system in the 70s. And they had already started to separate a lot of individuals, whether they were NF or MA members at that time. But what used to occur back then is you'd have sleepers on these yards that were NF members or, or MA members that were secretly out there on these main lines during this post-validation process. And the reason why is because all these organi organizations, they basically had the same creed that they could not admit that they were a member of, of any particular organizations. So that's why at times you'll hear about certain deaths and, and certain uh, begalas and certain things. And people say, oh, was that person a member of the NF or MA? And there's no validated proof. But a lot of the individuals at that time were actually sleepers out there on these yards. You know, and I'd say around the late 70s, the MA did one of the smartest moves that they could do. They created a, a, what we call a false narrative rumor that the NF were basically North Daniels and that their target was unknown Southern Hispanic inmates that were that, that play, paid no tribute or were not sympathizing with, with any of these organizations. And so they started this rumor in the LA County Jail and that's when you first started having individuals starting to represent uh, Therese. You know, a southern government, Sureños, whatever you may want to call it at that time, they started to establish themselves and they started to undertake the inmates' bidding. And um, at that time, what ended up happening, you had inmates that were spread out through all these different uh, prison facilities. And one of them that was uh, known for a gladiator school for having a lot of youth was uh, DVI Tracy. Now, bear in mind at that time, you had a lot of individuals that were uh, sleepers, like I said, on those yards. And so when the NF seen the creation, right, of the Sureños, they decided to undertake that they had to do something about it. And this is where in our history it says where the NF messed up because instead of focusing on maintaining the strongholds that they had, like in areas like San Diego, Chino, uh, different areas, Santa Barbara, different areas down south, they started to pay attention to the North Daniels that were starting to be oppressed by the Sureños bidding. You know, from our history standpoint, the Sudanians used to start attacking Northerners at random. They started trying to oppress them, have them pay rent, do all kinds of different things. The same thing that the MA used to do to brother Mexican uh, American inmates um, in the early 60s is the same thing that was starting to, to occur with these, these North Daniels. And there was less and less F NF members out there on these main lines at that time. And from according to Sundown, and I see I've heard, I heard different theories, you know, you hear it in Big's book as well. Fix said that it was Hobo that was put in charge of these North Daniels at that time. According to Sundown, it was Ricardo London. I don't know. I, I, maybe I'll reach out to, to Hobo and get a little more details on this. But they started to unite these North Daniels, you know, under the NF's umbrella at that time. And started to give them basic teachings from their, uh, not necessarily from their constitutions, but different things in order to secure themselves. Taught them how to make weapons, how to establish a yard, how to have somewhat of a chain of command. So they could go out there and fend for themselves on these yards. And from, from what I heard, um, before they even created the North Daniels, they were trying to start, there was talks of starting a sub-faction called uh, Raza uh, uh, Unida or Raza uh, Primera. I don't know what it was going to be called. And this was Bobo's idea. And the reason they were going to establish this was to fight back against the Sureños attempt to, for their expulsion. But at the same time, they still wanted to maintain their recruiting process down south because at, at that time, 
in a lot of rural areas down south, the NF still had a presence. They still had somewhat of a stronghold. So that started to occur. But eventually, as the CDC clamped down, they started identifying certain members out there on these main lines. A lot of them started to get slammed down. And I want to say it was in the early 80s in Tracy, which was a, always been gladiator school. They always used to send a lot of youngsters there. And a lot of North Daniels were being attacked. And so as the NF started to school and teach these individuals in West Hall and K-Wing that were coming back to the hole or, you know, off the main lines and being around other NF members, they implemented a 90-day policy, 90-day or 60-day policy, I forgot what it was, to go out there to these main lines and to get off and handle your business, to declare war against the Sudanians. And I think one of the, one of the pushing members um, of the North Daniel uh, movement back in Tracy at that time, man, is was Skip, none other than Skip. He's one of the first North Daniels that was pushing these lines. It's mentioned in our history in numerous times, and there was a lot of sacrifices that were going on. And this is where the uprising of the North-South really started to take fold behind the yards and to where the North Daniels started to have a strong presence. Without the NS, you know, directing the North Daniels and the MA directing the Sudanios, this North or South war would have never created. And see, the NF felt the need eventually to start some type of uh, farm team, a sub-faction that could continue to do the NF bidding and have some type of political obligation while at the same time have other individuals who were aligned but were just more along the lines of sympathizers. Therefore, you started to have the bonds and formats be created. And some of the key figures that were writing the bonds was Hector uh, Gopas Gallegos, Corny from Wood, uh, who's from Salinas, Corny from Woodland, and Brown Bob from Morgan Hill. This was signed off by both uh, Manos Sosa from Santa Barbara, as well as from Black Bob from Gilroy, who at that time was holding a key leadership position and so there's no exact date when the NR was formed, but I want to say it came out about 83 and 84, right? And that's when the implementation that was given forth and where they started to have some what of a recruiting basis into this NR movement. And what the New Sadasa was formed was to be a movement for the people to secure, educate, and establish foundations and footholds and have a chain of command and basically do the same thing that the NF used to do so they could continue to have a bidding. And throughout the years, the NR, you know, from my understanding, the term NR didn't start to take take uh, uh, take full till maybe 1990. But they already started to recruit people into the structure, NR. There's going to be a lot of um, discrepancies of when the NR was actually took took forth that title. I was told that the title was taken basically by, by an accident, the way it was signed, Nuestra Raza, so that's why they started to identify themselves as NR members. But the recruiting basis, you know, like anything else, has evolved and changed. You know, back then, they, the NF had created a certain CAT system, you know, CAT 1, CAT 2, CAT 3 for the NF members. And they did the same for the Nuestra Raza members. And there was no really checks or balances. You know, personally, I know two, two original NR members, you know, that are pretty well known that I've discussed before. You know, Larry uh, Paki Amaro was original NR member. I think he got recruited, I think, in Jamestown. Luis Huichel Gonzalez, same thing. They, they were both in Hawaii together, and they got recruited around 1984, I believe, or 85. And um, according to, you know, intel and research that I've done, um, CDC didn't start seeing things like NR tattoos or Nuestra Rasa to the, to the 90s, to around 1990. So there's a little bit of questions whether what titles it has changed, but as, as anything, anybody that's ever done time, the NR has always evolved into different directions. You know, and at that time, you know, in the 80s, there's not a lot of talk about the, the NF's history because they went underground in their, their activities. And it wasn't until about the around 89, 90, where they started to really try to force themselves out there in the streets. But one of the key areas in the 80s for NF activities and was out there in Stockton. You had, you know, Mad Dog out there, Cervantes. You had uh, Keonis that was out there. And you had a, a hood called Triple S at that time, Little Unity, which Little Unity was basically one of, the, one of the strongest sympathizing hoods that started to assist the NF regiments at that time. They don't get recognized enough. They were being trained out there in the streets to do uh, 
you know, all kinds of different home invasions, armored car robberies. And they were basically being schooled in the way of the NF on the streets in their regimental activities. I've met a lot of OGs from uh, from Little Unity that, that have stipulated this, that basically they were being taught to be baby C's out there in the streets. Therefore, some of the key members within the Nuestra Raza were actually from Little Unity. And other areas, of course, like Salinas had a stronghold, Sanjo, and all that. But the Nuestra Raza had different implementations through the years. You know, the structure, you can call it the same thing. You know, they took under the title, you know, at first it was a bro, it was head mono, and then it was bro, and the bonds and formats were, ch were changed. And the recruiting process was always different. You know, before there would be certain NR members that could basically held, held their own positions and they'd be running the facility. And when you'd get a sponsor, they would be the ones to authorize their status. Things started to change later on down the lines. Um, as everybody started to get pushed up to the bay and get validated, the validation process really started to take hold of the NR back in the early 90s. And that's around the time that they started to uh, they started to dismantle the CAT system because the NF at first was feeling that there was no checks and balances to check into someone's authority, to check into their rank or status. So there was four people who were elevating themselves to a certain rank, which there was no cross references to verify how they had this rank, whether it was cat one, cat two, cat three. And there was different um, procedures that were implemented within the NR. Like after 10 years, you could be put up for NF membership. There was a time frame when if you were an NR member, you had to function out there in the streets for 90 days. Even certain NR, reg NR started to establish certain regiments on the streets. So the NF, I say in the early 90s, they created something which you would call a uh, the, uh, they had a, a whole set of chain of command that was different from any facility. It was just for the Bay, and it was to take charge of the Nuestra Raza movement. Therefore, the Nuestra Raza would have its own chain of command and its own influence and influences and its own implementations. They would still answer to the NF, but they would do their own thing. And you had, I think, a Nuestra Raza council up there in the, up there in the Bay, NRC, which that would consist of individuals that had voting power to make any type of changes within the North Daniel movement. And I think it was either three members or five members. I mean, sometimes I forget, but I'm going to say three members. And then at that time, you had what you would call NRAs, Nuestra Raza Administrators. Now, this was just the CLC chain of command that was established for the Bay. So the council would sit there up in the Bay, and then you would have an administrators who fell in line under, see, this was their rank and file system. You would have NRAs, which would be the ones who filtered out all different directions that were going on for the NR movement, whether it be different educations, different branch and union, union policies, you know, uh, what new uh, rules and regulations were taking place within the NR movement that had been passed by the council. Because they felt that the same thing that the that the uh, NF was doing with its own mess out, that the NR could do the same thing as far as, and this was created by the NF. So the NRAs would basically almost be like like captains in a sense. And I think there was a, I want to say there was either, I don't know the exact amount, but there was at least five, I think there could be five to eight NRAs at one time. And that was a rank that you, it was kind of like having a cat, a, a cat ranking at that time. And their job was to, like I said, to forward out and filter, filter things out. And if you were on a main line, you'd want to channel to, to someone in the Bay, you'd want to channel to an NRA. So therefore you could report everything that was going on in your facility you can get communications back. And this is how the NR used to operate. And this is when the Nuestra Raza title started to really take fold in CDC. Now you also had NRTs at that time, Nuestra Raza teachers. And this was also up in the Bay. And their whole responsibilities were to conduct, conduct investigations, right? And to make any changes within the NR, NR teachings, Nuestra Raza teachings. Like I've discussed before, you had basically seven phases to an NR Soldado uh, schooling. And this was a, a, a base guideline for them to continue to educate themselves on a daily basis. There was no way to perfect these or to master these. You would continue your schooling, your education. And so within the seven phases, like I, I told before, you know, you'd have the first one, which would be uh, in, in our um, bylaws which would consist of your bonds, your formats, and all known NR and NF history. Then number two, you would have your NR communications or NR languages, which would be proper English, proper Spanish, proper Nahuatl, uh, 
different codes, sign language, you know, these are things that we'd always be having to evolve and change. Then you would have three, which would be weaponry and warfare tactics, right? Which would be all how to make a piece, you know, from a paper pedestal, how to cut metal, how to make a crossbow, zip gun, you know, bombs, all kinds of stuff. You know, there's a lot of teachings and you'd also learn different war tactics as far as cold warfare tactics. And what that means is to how to establish a main line and cut off your opposition's resources, you know, how to redirect uh, psychological warfare. There's a lot of things that go into it in our, in our um, Soldado schooling. And we get, we, we used to grasp things from different literature books that we used to study. We used to get a lot of different uh, directions from the NF. Um, and this is, that's the third phase. Now the fourth phase would be an important one, which would be a mainline training. How to get to a yard, how to establish a COC, how to establish hit squads, how to establish um, basically uh, sew up a yard, which at that time when you sew up a yard, what it meant was is you would have different homeboys in different key positions at, on a main line. Laundry, canteen, the front, you know what I mean? Uh, R&R, um, center complex, different porter jobs so we can go from building to building, plumber jobs so we can have some type of established foundation because Going into a mainline and establishing a mainline, yeah, you have to have security, of course. You have to have the numbers. You have to have a, you know, monitor all activities of your oppositions, whether it be the, the CDC administration or Sureños and Gavachos and all that, and identify key targets such as NLR, NLR members or strong sympathizing MA members. There's a lot that goes into it. So you're schooled in, in order how to secure a mainline to where it is your foothold. You know, because in our thinking, we could have only 50 homeboys and there could be 200 Southerners. But if we got everything established where we want it to be, that's our yard. And that's the mindset of, of an NR Soldado. And the fifth one would be uh, basically all legal law, right? Because with all the changings in, this, in the validation processes and, and your rights being oppressed and, and by CDC administration, and the crooked judicial system we wanted also allows to start to learn different things as far as within their legal endeavors so they could sit there and fight the system so they could fight cdc so they can fight their validations and so we would teach them all kinds of different things and how to shepherdize cases how to file habeas corpuses tort claims whatever it may be there's a never-ending ceaseless battle as you can see in these uh, phases for you to continue your edu educational indoctrination or your, your your progress, these seven phases can never be mastered because as this as the world changes, as the penal system changes, we have to evolve and adapt, and that's the whole focal point to why you have these seven phases. Now, the sixth one would be um, character analysis and psychoanalysis of soldados and recruitment procedures, which would be how to review certain manpower that could be beneficial. Because back then, like I said. It wasn't mandatory for you to do like fall in line with a chain of command like there is now. When you would get to a main line, you would basically follow the, the basic procedures, you know, check in with your paperwork, where you're from, and that you were a homeboy. And you'd be plugged into the household and you'd be given the brief expectations of household policies verbally, yard policies verbally. It'd be simple. Stay suited and be booted, walk in twos, and when it's time to get off, get off. That's all it was to it. And, uh, and the chain of command and the politicking and the things that take into securing the yard would be left to the NR soldados. So you go to the yard, you could tell the difference. You, you could see that little group over there communicating and doing all the, the uh, security procedures. Those would usually be the NR members or its sympathizers. And at that time, the recruitment process has had since changed throughout the years. You know, before it, it could have been an NR member that had the authority to the yard. He could basically clear someone's status, had been an NR member for a while. And had to have at least, you know, one to two sponsors. And then what ended up happening is the NF started to take hold of things in the 90s when they created that chain of command change in the Bay and gave the NR its, its own chain of command and stripped them of their cat ranking system. What they did from there was they made it mandatory that in order to be an NR soldado, you had to have one sponsor, at least two sponsors, preferably. They had at least five years as an NR soldado and it had to be sanctioned and cleared through a C. The majority of the time, it'd be the RC set facility, or basically they would be able to, you would be also able to run checks and filter people's names to the bay to get their statuses cleared. 
as long as you had a channel to someone who was an NRA or even to the NRC, or even if you were bypassing that and you were communicating with a certain NF member, you could get someone's status basically validated and stamped. And so those were the requirements. Uh, they stopped allowing it other NR members who would claim that they had camp ranking systems just to sanction people's statuses. So that was to, you know, alleviate the, the inappropriate recruitment that was occurring within, in, the, in the NR because the same problems that the NF started to have in the late 70s where they started to recruit anybody was the same thing that you started to see within the NR member. And what you had as you had solid individuals that were getting rolled up and validated, you had a lot of leftovers that were out there that had, um, they had their own personal agendas out there. They were abusing their status and rank for their own personal needs. Not everywhere. There was a lot of good NR members, but that's what started to occur. And the seventh phase of NR style schooling would be street concepts or street functions. Like I said, it was optional to step out and function. You know, a lot of NR members elected not to function out there on the streets. And if you were ever trying to elevate your status to that of a C, there's two things that they'd want to see from you. One, if you were willing as an NR member to go out there and function in the streets, that said a lot about who you were. Not assist, but function, be on the books, and be accounted as an NF associate. That was going to go a long way. The other part would be if you, if you were willing to make that ultimate sacrifice and take a life. As I've discussed before, you know, if you go back to warfare tactics, you had, used to have what you call SKP team, superior killing power. And their whole objective was to take a life and um, in, in hopes to one day be assented to a position as an NF member. So that was basically the seven phases, man. And like I said, you know, there's been a lot of influential members, you know, Corny, Brown Bob and Kopas, they were all known as the forefathers of the NR, specifically Corny, because, of, you know, both other individuals, you know, are no, either one's no longer with us or one's no longer active. And so that, that was the imposition that was going on within the NF, uh, maintaining the NR to maintain their bidding on these lines. They were basically a farm team. And what the NF started to question was this. They started to see that the NR started to go and gain its own momentum and they started to look at themselves as its own entity, its own organization. And what that does is it creates turmoil, it creates conflict in order for the NF to maintain checks and balances while still controlling these yards is when you have the 497 solitations of the of the disbandment uh, of the NR, which had a lot of which had a strong impact within the system, man. This is one of the causes I feel of the S and Y growth because there had been individuals that were on these main lines while a lot of NF members were up in the shoe doing time. I mean, they were putting in their own work, but these NR members were out there making sacrifices, dying, uh, putting in work. And when you sit there and, and take something that a lot of people committed themselves, their lives to, and made them on equal footing with everyone else, there was a backlash effect about that, man. And I kind of related to that, man. I kind of felt the same way when all when all the different changes finally started to get forwarded out. Because it took about two years for everything to be filtered out about the changes. You didn't start seeing the and it was even my first visions of the of the solitations uh changes was it was supposed to go from you were no and our member was supposed to be deleted and bros and hermanos were supposed to be deleted. You were supposed to have and soldados, Norteño soldados who were obligated Norteños who were former NR members. And then you were supposed to have just regular Norteños. So they continued the same recruiting process, you know, after they did this, uh, uh, disbanded the NR. It's just what they used to promote was this is, uh, uh, and Soldado was one who was committed to the lucha, the struggle, to the Norteño movement. And a Northerner was an ally to the Norteño movement but had the same equal rights. The things that used to change that were pre-existing before 497 was before you would, the bonds and formats and all those, that training was, was privileged information. You weren't receiving the bonds and formats unless you were pulled, recruited or tipped up. And these were the terms that we used to use. And so the NR has a long extensive history, man. And, and I mentioned yesterday about Brad Prigley, um, Pablo from Sacramento and he was actually killed January 22nd, 1989. It wasn't 88. I did a little more research on that. So I have to do a little disclaimer on that, man. But he was one of the first casualties of the of the, of the CDC um, taking the life of an NR member. And that's one of the reasons that that happened on January 22nd, 1989. And they also give the birth date of 1922nd, 1984 
as being the newest Rasa birthday. So that's supposed to be one of the days that's recognized as basically a, in our in our holiday or the birth of the North Daniel movement and collective. So this is a very, very brief rundown, man. I'm going to eventually probably do a part two and I'm going to discuss some of the NR influential members. But I wanted to just do basically a quick breakdown. And like I said, some of the years may be off on my end when things happen, when the NR started to take it, its, its groove and, and started to recognize itself. The term structure, um, which did exist, but it was called the XIV structure in North Daniels. And that's where the term northern structure came from CDC at that time. But there's been a, a lot of changes throughout the years. Just like today, as you see, always you have new filters coming out, new changes, new rules and regulations. Through the 84 to 97 when the NR was basically active. And in my belief, I believe the NR was already existing. Uh, it what may have not been called Nusarasa, but I believe it was already existing around 83 or 82. I've heard that from several individuals who were the first ones pushing that line back in the days. That it was already around. But they just weren't using the term Nusarasa. They were calling themselves the structure of North Daniels. So there's going to be a lot of discrepancies, a lot of questions. But, you know, like I said, a lot of us weren't there during this time frame. So all we're doing is applying the information that's been filtered out through the years. Like I said, I do reach out to a lot of different sources, people who were present at that time, who were active in our members, as well as those who do extensive, extensive legal, uh, legal history through CDC documents. And uh, one thing that came to shock me was in the CDC system, there was they never seen any NR or Nuestra Rasa documented until the 1990s, believe it or not. So there's always going to be question as far as what was going on within the NR collective. When did they first start to really change their thing and push their push? Anyways, I will do a part two on this in the coming weeks. And I'm going to go into a lot of influential NR members, how they establish themselves, even some of the internal conflict and, and the different rules and regulations that I didn't discuss here. But this is your boy Flacco, man. I hope you enjoy this video. Please hit the like and subscribe. As always, we're pushing a ton of content.